Hey everyone, this is Raj Geary with WrestlingInc.com. I'm joined here once again with Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics. Brandon, how are you doing? I'm good, Raj. Thanks for having me again. Ah, it's always good having you on. I, I, I wasn't sure if to, you know, wait when uh, 2020, uh, 2020 results were posted or not, but hopefully we can have you back then too. So that'll like probably be the, probably February. 2020? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'll they haven't announced when that's going to happen yet, but it's probably early February is when it usually happens. The Q4 yeah. and full year report. Yeah, and so that's a ways away. So I thought it, you know, let's uh, let's catch up before that to to look back at 2020 and what a freaking crazy year it was. Um, first full year of AEW on TV. Uh, first full year technically of it in existence. Uh, Impact. Now we're starting to get television ratings for Impact, WWE, COVID, no fans basically since mid-March, uh, live events basically gone, um, mm-hmm. and yet WWE, their most profitable year yet. Um, kind of in a, just in a general nutshell, what would you think, of, you know, what, how would you describe WWE's 2020? Well, if, I think it's a year that really highlights and if you look into it a little bit, you, you really understand how the wrestling business has changed from at least like decades ago, being heavily reliant on ticket sales and on running live events. And uh, since the middle of March, 2020, there were no live events. There were no tickets sold, but yet WWE, as you mentioned, it's going to have its most in the year is over. So it's had its most profitable year ever in all likelihood. Uh, we know the first three quarters, uh, I can't remember the first three quarters alone made it. I think the first three, three quarters alone uh, were its most profitable year ever. So unless they report some negative number for Q4, they've already made it. Uh, but, but I don't think they're going to report a, a negative number. I think they're going to report even more net income and even more operating income. So, but, and that's all because of uh, how the business has uh, become, you know, benefited by the, the change in the media landscape and the change in the media economy. Uh, particularly from from cable, where cable uh, as fewer and fewer homes subscribe to cable, that has caused the cable networks to rely on and increasingly value the top rated programs. So they really have to keep those programs on their networks. Otherwise, people are going to be more likely to just cancel their their cable subscription, especially the, the programs that are that are top rated and those that are watched live. Um, because that, for one thing, that makes the programs more DVR proof. And, and so we're thinking about things like uh, sports. News has done amazingly well, too, in 2020, for reasons you can probably imagine. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the networks rely heavily on their top programs more than ever. And that's probably going to be the, the case going into the future, at least the next few years, I think. So WWE, for one, uh, has gotten more TV rights fees. They, they uh, in 2018, uh, finished a deal with NBC Universal and another deal with Fox that resulted in more than tripling their their last deal. These are five year deals for WWE. So it's it's a business that's really been turned on its head uh, decades ago when I was growing up watching WF superstars on my local Fox network. Uh, that was paid programming. That was essentially a, an infomercial that you know, WF had to pay for to, to get that slot and, and similar, I think around the country. Um, and now they're not paying for TV. Certainly the, the, the TV networks are paying them. Um, and, and that's driving the majority of their revenue this year. And that would have been the case, I think, even without COVID, even if they had run, right. uh, maybe it would have been close in terms of revenue. But, but next year, the, just the nature of these contracts is that, you know, every year they get increased, it seems, by about 10%. So uh, they, they're now on their second year as of October. They're on their second year of the contract. So they're probably getting a 10% increase versus what they got for the first 12 months of the deal. So that's, that's only going to increase over time. And it's going to make up you know, a little bit more of a majority of their revenue each year. And uh, who knows what the future will be like, the future of media, but uh, there's, there's no end to it in sight. Right. And this was only the first full year of the new TV contracts, uh, right. which started in October. Now, looking at the year-to-year declines, I know people say, well, everything's down, viewing habits are changing, and that is- All TV is case. down. Ex- yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, WWE, and, and this is one of those years, it's, it's 
there's a lot of buts, you know, it's like they were way down, but they really took a big hit when uh, they were at the performance center and then, you know, came back a little bit at the Thunderdome, just looking at raw, just looking at December, uh, they averaged 1.668 million viewers for the month. Um, you know, last year they did 2.14 million. That's about a 21% decline year to year for December, which was kind of a more regular month in, in the sense when you're looking year to year or December of this year compared to December of last year. Um, as far as cable television, what have the drops been? You hear it's single digits, right? If you, t if you factor out news. Right. So I'm looking at a spreadsheet right now. And, and it's, it's easiest for me based on the data that I have to look at P1849. I can look at P2 plus, uh, the total sure. audience P2 plus also, but it's a little bit more complicated because of the way I'm getting the data from showbizdaily.com and sure. they're, they're always ranking everything by P1849 because okay, that's so what advertisers care about. Sure. Um, but I, so I have P2 plus also, but I think, uh, I think was... it would be similar if I was to rank it by P2 plus anyway. Uh, Top 50 programs in 2020 were down, this is excluding cable, were down 24% uh, in P P18, in total, 49. Okay. And Raw was down 29%. Um, so Raw doing like five, five points, five, five percentage points worse than non-news cable. New, include news cable and, and, it's, and, and everybody's up, you know. And including news, what was it? In, if you include news, yeah. then then the comparison, I think I think it's even. Or if uh, if you uh, just do news alone, it's up like twenty or thirty percent or something like that. And what about network TV? SmackDown. You know, again, it's hard to compare SmackDown because mm -hmm. October last year they had the the huge premiere. Um, if you're looking at just December, they they averaged a 0.62 this past uh, last month. Uh, 2.167 million viewers, whereas the year before in December, they averaged a 0 0.70, 2.4 million viewers. Um, so a, a bit of a drop there um, compared to other shows on, on network TV. What is that drop like? At least on their night, they're usually the most watched program in the key demo. Yeah. Uh, not in, not in the total audience, right. but just in the key demo, because there's, there's a lot of other, uh, network programming like just looking at uh january 8th this most recent friday uh there's they're going against programs like shark tank and blue bloods which uh they do really close to in the key demo but but those programs blow smackdown away in total audience and i'm, I'm, I'm noticing here that they're doing two decimals now on the demo numbers right which is yeah big, that big, just started like last week right this is the first time I'm ever, I'm ever laying eyes on it right now. This is yeah. this is big news in my world. <laughs> it is, yeah, because otherwise... A second would, decimal place. <laughs> yeah, this would be a 0. 0.6 otherwise for SmackDown. Yeah. Because I, I, th I think the history is, like in Nielsen, that, you know, broadcast net, big network programming would always do the bigger numbers. So you only maybe only need, need one decimal mm -hmm. place. But now viewership has gotten so small that, right. it, you know, it, it's better to have two decimal places. And that's what they do do for cable. But yeah, it's uh, in the key demo which is what drives advertising. And when I looked at recently Fox's SEC filings, it looks like Fox relies on advertising revenue more so than the cable networks do. I, I still think uh, Fox is, I, I basically know that cable, you know, Fox is charging uh, cable systems and satellite systems a fee, affiliate fees to, to carry Fox. If you're a direct TV, you gotta pay money to carry Fox on your system. Um, but advertising revenues make up a majority, I think, of, of Fox, of broadcast Fox's revenue. Whereas for cable networks, cable companies like NBC Universal and Warner Media Turner, the majority of their revenue comes from affiliate fees. So selling the rights to carry their networks on cable and satellite systems. But, but yeah, if, if to answer your question, they're, they're uh, what did they do last week? 0.56. In the key demo, Shark Tank at the point point eight, so they don't look too good on on last week Friday. But but most of the time when I've looked at this, they're they're the most highly ranked uh, broadcast primetime TV show on Friday night. Usually, I was I was kind of kind of surprised the ranking was down so much last Friday as far as you know how they're ranked in eighteen forty nine, just because 
I kind of assumed they'd get hurt by the news just because it was still fresh, you know, coming off the U.S. Capitol attack. And then also that was the day when Trump's getting banned on Twitter. All this stuff is still happening. It's very fluid. Mm -hmm. But the other uh, shows on network television didn't seem to be impacted as much. So, um, yeah, this this looks to me I'd have to look into it closer. But this looks to me like unusually high viewership and the, the broadcast networks for a Friday night. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, you've got a lot of uh, CNN is in the top seven spots. People right. are watching a ton of news on that night as well. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it seemed I, I, I didn't, I couldn't fully get it because the, the, you know, around a 0.6 is what it would normally be if they're, they're rounding up. And that usually wins the night right. demo for SmackDown. Uh, this right. Week. Cause this is a normal number for SmackDown. If you rounded it up at 0.6, that's normally what they do in the key demo. Right. So, yeah. Um, go into cable you know, streaming people, you know, talking about cable slowly dying. You were saying how you think cable is still going to be around for, for a while, but it is, it does seem to be becoming more and more reliant just on news and sports as opposed to other shows. And when you're seeing hot shows coming up, usually it's, you know, like a Mandalorian ABC isn't putting that on, even on broadcast. They're putting that on their streaming service. You're seeing HBO max now really, you know, releasing all these big movies, um, instead of holding off on them, releasing them on HBO Max with this big trend towards streaming, you know, uh, AEW, WWE, they have these long-term contracts. They got years and years to go. But at what point do those intersect? At what point are, is it, are we going to see wrestling probably move to a streaming service? I mean, we, we're not really seeing much live uh, sports streaming yet. Amazon yeah. has played with it. Um, but it does seem like that's just over time that's where where things are headed yeah I, I think it's it's down to the nature of which which form of media is it easiest or is, it, is it sort of most convenient or most beneficial for me to consume this type of content when it's, when, it, when you're talking about like things like mandalorian and scripted entertainment these are these are obviously programs that were filmed and edited right months ago so there's not so much immediacy about about watching it and in another era, it would have maybe aired in prime, something like that would have aired in prime time on ABC. And that would have been kind of your only shot to watch it. And then I think in the early 2000s, you know, you could DVR it and uh, watch it when, kind of whenever you want, but you still have to have the cable subscription in order to record it on your DVR. But now we're in an era where, you know, it's, uh, it, I can just watch stuff whenever I want. And in fact, uh, if a streaming service puts out a handful of episodes or a season of episodes of a program, you know, in, in one you know, instance, they, they found that people will watch an entire season and they'll get more consumption and people will get more use out of the service that way. And the more people use a service, probably less likely they are to cancel it. So those scripted programs are just easier to consume that way. Will wrestling go to a streaming service? I don't know, because I mean, maybe someday, when I think we're, we are getting close to the point where the number of Netflix subscriptions in the U United States are getting close to the number of cable homes. I think the number of cable homes is, if you, t if you think about like what's among the, um, the most covered, the, the, the most, the, the, the cable networks that are in the most number of homes. So say USA Network and TNT right. are, so are among 90 those. million or less than that now? I, I think he has something like 85 million probably yeah. now. So Netflix is in something like 70 million homes. If you include Canada, I think Canada is about 10% of the population in the U S so, you know, it's a, it's probably, you know, 10 or 15 or maybe even 20 million homes short of the most popular cable networks. Um, but anyway, but yeah. Netflix, I'm sorry, uh, just real quick. Netflix has continued to grow, right? While mm -hmm. the cable numbers have continued to come down. Netflix, I would have to look. I did, I did do a, I did, <laughs> I, I looked at their last um, quarterly report and I did right. do a, do a graph and I made a chart. I think they're, they're starting, I think they're, they're close to saturation in the United States is sort of the vibe. Oh. I think they grew a little bit, but, uh, but it's not, it's not huge growth at this point. I right. think the, the, the market kind of feels like it, and it's getting close to the number of cable homes. So it's, it's, it's close. And the, and the W network has uh totally stalled in 2019. They've recovered a little bit in 2020. And I think that's largely due to the, the wider consumer embrace of streaming technology related to the pandemic. Yeah. So as far as wrestling going to streaming, you know, we heard in early 2020, just before the pandemic, Vince McMahon talking about how 
And but part of the reason why I, th- I think he fired George Barris and Michelle Wilson was because he want he decided he wanted to uh, forget putting pay reviews exclusively on the network and let's see if we can sell them to another streaming player and get more guaranteed money out of it. And I think that was very much opposed to the strategy that Barrow and Wilson had applied for many years. Um, they, they, they've come out with their new investment firm yesterday, though. Did you see that? Right. I saw that. Yeah. 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 And, and George Barrios now has a goatee. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I did not see that. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> it's good to see them still working together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're staying together. Uh, they were fired together and they're continuing <laughs> to work together. Yeah. So uh, kind of like if it was a movie, there'd be a little romance angle thrown in there, but yeah, yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, but yeah, will, will, will pay-per-views go to a, a streaming service? Um, I think maybe, maybe something happened in, in, in the, uh, the late winter there where it sounded like maybe Vince was talking to ESPN plus or something like that. Right. According to, to Meltzer, he wanted, uh, a fee in excess of what UFC got. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was something like fifty million dollars per year. I don't. It, it's out there publicly, but uh, he wanted a lot of money for it probably. And then the pandemic came, and that probably caused some financial trouble for for Disney maybe, um, and ultimately for ESPN. So they have Nick Khan now, who's basically taking the president role that the co-presidents vacated after they were fired. And Nick Khan is somebody who has a lot of experience in dealing with media rights, and he's the one who, in fact helped and was probably the biggest player involved in getting WWE's current US TV deal. So I think that increases WWE, increases the, the optimism that you might have about whether WWE is going to continue to get a favorable TV rights deal in the future. But he hasn't, I mean, he's only been there since August and it's January now, but, but he hasn't made any new deal and there haven't been any rumblings really about OW's talking to Peacock or, or ESPN plus again. So I don't know. Um, I, th- I think for now wrestling, among live sports and sports like things it continues to be maybe best monetized through uh through cable just because cable is supported by this uh you know 80 to 90 million pool of people who who pay you know i i, I don't uh, subscribe to cable i don't know if you do raj but it's it's it, i've heard it's expensive and uh there are people who who continue to support that system so but when you say cable are you counting like youtube tv because that is kind of the same right so i i subscribe to sling so right. we would call that a virtual MVPD and the, all the cable and satellites are just regular MVPDs. So then that, that's kind of supporting that too. But I think the, so like Sling, for example, is owned by Dish Network. And I think that's, it's sort of this, the strategy for Dish is that, all right, look, we're not going to capture uh, the, the total market of, of people that we once were able to capture. So we've got to do right. something and then we're going to do Sling and we're going to uh, offer it at a price that doesn't really make it totally worth it, but at least it'll get some people in and maybe we can incrementally raise the the price point over time. I think, I think that's the idea uh, behind some of these virtual MVPDs. Yeah. Um, And so when they say USA networks and 85 million homes, that's including sling. Yeah, I I believe so. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Cause I mean, as far as like a dish or cable, I can't see my kids growing up saying, Hey, I'm going to get a dish installed, or I'm going to wait for the cable guy when they could right. open their phone. And, you know, they get pretty much everything uh, you could get on cable or a dish. And that's kind of where I see just, you know, just fundamental, fundamentally, um, uh, the mentality towards television changing, just the, the ease of consumption and the ease of um, access. And I, I mean, I just, I don't know where the, you know, like dish companies are going to be in 15 years when, uh, you got a generation that's grown up with their phones and know how easy it is to pretty much get everything other than, you know, uh, was it direct TV Sunday or, uh, their big football package Sunday outside ticket. of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sunday ticket. But I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking and trying to, uh, you know, look for a signal of what's this big expensive property. And I know NFL is on Amazon prime, right? Right. They have, and I think those are just digital. Just a, a couple of games yeah, like on Thursdays. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's on Twitch too, right? So Amazon owns Twitch as well. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for, there's got to be a big audience that's actually watching. And I heard there were something like a, a few million people watching an NFL game recently through the digital means. Mm-hmm. So it, it, just, we've get, just got to get to the point where that we're watching something live through a, a digital medium becomes something that a large number of people do. And I think it's at least early days in that. I think that's many years away, but maybe, maybe over time we'll, uh, you know, 
everything will be will be a virtual MVP deal where all these streaming services will have some sort of live linear channel. Right. Um, and there are even all these other players like uh, the Roku channel and Fubo mm -hmm. and things like that that do have a number of linear streams in addition to the video on demand content that they have. And, and maybe that's where New Japan will, will end up uh, whenever that gets revealed sometime soon for they, they've been hyping a, uh, a, a new uh, media partner for uh, the U S and UK market. Right. So overall WWE looking back at their 2020 um, successful business wise, successful monetarily uh, the subscriptions were up ratings were down um, the content. I was not a big fan of their content. Um, I thought creatively it was kind of a low point in a lot of ways. Um, I, I did think SmackDown was a lot better than, and then raw. Um, are they safe right now on the path that they're on where they're losing 20 to 30% of their audience, but they're kind of losing, you know, losing more than, than television, but they're both losing. So uh, they're still safe. Are they safe or are they going to have to, uh, turn the ship around a little bit. Yeah, I, I was uh, involved in a Twitter conversation last night. Somebody, there's like some, uh, there's this sort of sometimes you can find like this community of people who are not necessarily following wrestling closely, yeah, but are following the stock. And uh, somebody sent me a DM and said, you might want to chime in here. And uh, just, uh, I, I think there's, uh, you know, WB is a huge brand. It's It's got all this legacy IP, which you can see on the network. It's got all these characters and, trademarks that it owns and it's got massive global name id it's going to take a long time to say the least for aw or any other wrestling brand to come close to that but i think that the trajectory that we're on and if if vince mcmahon lives for a long time and stays healthy for a long time and continues to control creative i think i mean i don't know how long the timeline has to be but on a long enough timeline i think um W being the leader, at least those flagship brands being the leader, uh, that, that that can't last forever. And I have no confidence that Vince is going to get better. He's going to start uh, learning how to create stars again. Um, so I just think on, on a long enough timeline, and it's probably sometime after 2023 when new TV deals get done. Um, I don't think Raw and SmackDown are going to be the leader in in P18 to 49 viewership, at least. We're, we're seeing... 18 to 34, the lower half of that demographic get really close between Dynamite and Raw. In fact, there was there was there was one week in December where Dynamite exceeded Raw. And th this is the week where Raw had its lowest rating ever, and Dynamite had the uh, the follow up to Winter is Coming and the the interview with Sting, and uh, it and it beat Raw in 18 to 34. And I think we're going to see that happen quite a few times in 2021, where uh, AEW it has decisively beaten NXT. NXT continues to lead AW though with people over the age of 50. So when, when I pause there and say, ah, well, at least 1849, it's because WWE has this enormous bank of people over the age of 50 that watch their program. Now, these are the people who just tend to watch TV more. And I think there's, you know, plenty of younger people who are following wrestling in one way or another digitally, um, but they have an, an enormous P50 audience that AEW doesn't have as much. But uh, yeah, over time, I, I, I think uh, the way that Vince uh, books the product and I was, uh, I, I don't watch it that much. I, I put it, I put the pay-per-views on in the background and uh, I'll watch AEW sometimes, but it's it seems like a product that just doesn't make people care about it. And I, I, I just have to stop and think sometimes, be like, who's, who's watching this? I want to have like focus groups and, and like talk to random people who watch WWE and be like, what, what are you watching it for? Like, what do you, what do you like about it? Or, or are there so many people maybe like us who are, you know, following it for one reason or another, or, you know, you've got a podcast or, you know, you, you've got a community of people that you, that you talk about it with. Yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of meta watching and that's certainly where I am, where I'm, the, the story of the business is vastly more interesting to me than any yeah. intentional story that they tell. <laughs> I mean, no, I hear you. Um, when was the last time you sat through a, an entire episode of Raw? <laughs> I mean, my, my attention is like so in and out. Like I, I, I'll put it on, I, I put it on a bunch of times this yeah. you know, in 2020, but 
I don't know, to give it three hours, my 100% attention, it's probably been years, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm following what happens closely, but I'm not going to, going to give it like my full attention for, th for three hours. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. So that third hour of raw at, at what point, because of the money they are making with that third hour, if you were to take that money deal, what was it? 240 million per year. Uh, 265 million average annual value over five years. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, that's 80, what, 85 million per hour of raw taken uh, or, or a little less, but taking that out, that's a big chunk of revenue. You know, if you were to treat all hours uh, equally, but by not, by keeping that in how, you know, the, the loss of popularity year after year, I mean, you got to think that three hours, uh, that three hour time frame just keeps costing you viewers over time. And at, at, at what point does that meet where the money you're making with that third hour uh, catches up with the, the decline in popularity? Yeah. I think I heard a uh, triple H was on the bill Simmons podcast. And he says, if Vince just sees it as a challenge and that sounds like Vince that he just <laughs> wants to, he wants to, you know, see if he can do it. And it, that's, what's been happening since, you know, 2012. And I'm, and I'm sure, you know, people at WWE and people at NBC Universal understand that they may be diluting the product to some degree, especially now where they're putting NXT on, on TV in addition to that. And, and you've got AEW as, as well. Um, but I think uh, it's, it is a lot of money, but I think there is an argument that, um, and I think there's an argument that you can make to investors and may cause a short-term hit to the stock. I think there's an argument where you say, look, we've, uh, it's not going to happen, but, but I think there's an argument for it that, that, uh, you say, we're going to take a, a short-term hit now, but we believe this is really going to help us in the long run, in the long run, uh, maintain fans and develop stars. And but there, there's so many problems, you know, prior to any of that, that <laughs> that's, that's limiting what's going on with them. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think there's an argument for, you've got too much content out there and everybody's attention, uh, for entertainment and for time is extremely competed for more now than ever and more in the future than now that uh, we're going to cut this down to two hours and uh, make the two hours really great. And uh, ra rather than a, a, an okay three hours, and that's going to help us in the future. Um, but I don't think they're going to do that. I, th I, don't, I don't, I wouldn't rule it out for a, a, a new deal uh, that would go into effect in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, yeah, I, I don't see it happening. And um, yeah, we've got NXT. Uh, in there as well. So I, I could see a, you know, a deal where they make new deals and that would go into effect in 2024. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's more money for NXT and it's a, and it's a two hour raw or something like that. Yeah. And NXT, by the way, is probably their, their first deal is probably going to expire in September. So I would expect to hear some sort of news, maybe not a number, but some sort of news about uh, NXT getting a new deal with, with USA, which is, I think where they stay. Yeah. I know D Dave Meltzer has said, uh, and, you know, he's speculated in the past about how uh, it's worth it for USA and WWE to keep NXT head to head with AEW, even though it's costing USA viewers and, and, and you know, the, the demo rating um, earlier this year, NXT, they were kind of doing around a 0.2 to a 0.24 uh, before the pandemic. After that, more or less averaging about a 0.18. Uh, in, in, in 18 to 49, the total viewers has kind of been pretty consistent in, in the sense it's like between, you know, 650 to 750, you know, throughout the year is what it's kind of been averaging. Yeah. Um, you think they, they keep that route? I mean, they, they've had the few weeks where they are on a different night. They're doing 850, you know, over 800,000 viewers as opposed to the six and seven hundreds. But, you, you know, again, we don't have a long term to see if those view, viewing habits stay because that does ha equal to another night of wrestling and at some point that burnout sets in but um you think that uh that might sway them at all or are they they happy with the way things are at because it, it does seem like wwe has abandoned the, the idea of having nxt being an equal third brand yeah, I, you're asking if they'll go to a different night, right? Yeah, yeah. If it makes sense for them to, uh, first off, and uh, second is WWE. Uh, do you see them treating NXT at any point as wanting to to become uh, an equal third brand because of all the the money and and things that come with the TV ad revenue? You know, with new deals. I think the viewership would have to get a lot closer. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the money would have to get closer for, for, I guess, for Vince and for the company itself to, to elevate it. I, but it's sort of, I don't know, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because I think it is, it is clearly positioned as the number three brand. And I think that's, that's a lot of what affects the perception and keeps it and maybe keeps their viewership lower. Um, but moving a night, I think, um, I think they'll stay on Wednesday and I think they'll remain going head to head with, with AEW. Um, I think they don't want it, you know, sort of admit defeat, but then, you know, outwardly, when you listen to the conference calls where Triple H gets asked about it, he gets very uncomfortable and, and, you know, they, they defiantly think that they were always on when they were always on Wednesday night and it's, and it's dynamite that came to their night. Um, but I, but I don't think NXT is on the USA network if, if AEW wasn't on TNT. Um, but, uh, no, I think it's a, is it beneficial for NBCU to have NXT where it is? Would it be better to have it on a different night? It would help the viewership, but would it, would it be the best thing for their goals? I don't know. It, I guess it, it would help uh, NXT grow its brand value, but that's, I don't think that's the primary goal. And maybe if you're a WWE, it, maybe it shouldn't be. Uh, I think AEW is a real threat. And uh, I think privately they know that. And uh, if, if you let AEW be on a night by itself with no res- wrestling opposition, it's going to have ratings that are 20% higher. And I, I imagine that they're afraid that when negotiation time comes up, and that'll be probably starting sometime in 2022 and probably ending sometime in 2023, I think there's serious questions about how close those viewership numbers are going to be around that time. And uh, it, it's, it's helpful for them to have NXT out there sort of dampening what those numbers are. Um, because I think if, uh, you know, if those numbers are too close, maybe the value and the leverage that WWE is able to, to use in negotiations isn't as strong if you know, a network can say, well, especially if they're negotiating around the same time and that option for AEW gets picked up and extends it to, the, to a year, which would make AEW negotiations and W negotiations happening around the same time. And if, if I'm a network and I can say, all right, I'm looking at the numbers here and uh, you know, you want me to pay X amount of dollars, but, but look, there's this other wrestling company out here that's doing almost the same or in some demos better than what you are. Like, I, I think that's uh, I don't, I don't know that that's just my own game theory and speculation, but that I think that's what you know, what they're afraid of. And and it's not as if, because you know, when we've, uh, I've talked about this subject before, some people say, well, why not just let, let the chips fall? If you're a USA Network, you're NBC Universal, why not just let the chips fall where they may? And then, you know, if, if Raw dies, then you can pick up a dynamite. But I think, um, I think AEW and uh, Turner are very close and it, it would cost a premium to get AEW to leave where it is. So that you'll be, if you're NBC, you probably, if, if that's what would happen, and if, and if you wanted to buy up the rights to AEW, you'd pay, you know, in excess of, of what you would, would be paying to per viewer hour to, to retain right. raw, if that makes sense. It would be more expensive for you and less return. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to just touch briefly on Impact and then talk a little bit about AEW before we wrap up. <clears throat> uh, Impact, you know, we started getting numbers. You uh, you at WrestleNomics, you guys at WrestleNomics posted uh, the viewership for the year um, up until uh, we started getting the numbers at, at show, bu- show Buzz Daily. Yeah. And um, they suddenly appeared in Nielsen. I've heard that Axis was in Nielsen early yeah. in 2020. Wow. We never got any numbers until until the Kenny Omega hype. And then all of a sudden, the week before that, yeah, the week before that, uh, that December first episode was the first time we saw an yeah. access, and I was I remember just I was like what what happened here? Why? Is, uh, and but, it wasn't because they they finished in the top one hundred and fifty for the first time. That's the first time that any access program ever appeared on Showbiz Daily. So I don't, I don't know who knows why. Yeah, um, but yeah, so we saw uh, we saw a big big boost clearly with Kenny Omega. Uh, he when he appeared on. He, he, they did 221,000 viewers. The episode that he was on quickly fell back last week. It was 148,000 before, you know, we're taping this kind of back to where they were Their Their overall average was 160,000 for the year last year. So they're, uh, or I'm sorry, 154,000. So a little under what their average was for last year impact where they're at. Um, Kenny Omega kind of, it, they're kind of back to where they were. I mean, are they, is there much room for growth there? I mean, they, they, we've seen a consistent drop year after year after year. 
Um, just looking at the numbers, what do you make of, uh, of where they're at? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of promotions outside of WNAW where I, like, I don't know what they're, I think all these different promotions, if they're going to set themselves apart or gain any momentum, they have to have some sort of superpower or offer wrestling fans something that they are not getting in the same quality elsewhere. And in the case of Impact, Ring of Honor, I guess MLW and uh, maybe NWA if, if you know they're on hiatus or whatever right now. But I, I think if you're going to be one of these second or third brand wrestling companies, you need to, you need to have a superpower. And I'm, I'm just not sure what, what that is for impact. I've, I've wa- I did watch it a couple of times and it just felt like they're still trying to be WWE to me. Um, it, it, it's interesting when, when Kenny Omega comes on and I think whenever there's something that is essentially a news story that does pop a rating. And I think that's true when, you know, you, you could sense the buzz, at least on Twitter when, you know, when Don Callis and Kenny Omega did that angle. And, uh, and I think a, another uh, example of kind of a new story popping a rating and, and it's not obviously their intention, but when, when Brody Lee passed away, you know, that, that resulted in a higher than usual viewership for, for AEW dynamite. But, uh, but yeah, I did, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're getting numbers for impact here. And it's, it's about in, in the range of what you would expect that they are, but, uh, it's a, it's a really huge non P1849 audience too. So that tells me that they're probably a pretty old median viewer. So, uh, yeah, I just, I don't, don't see a ton of momentum in, in these other products unless they start to, to differentiate themselves in some way. Yeah. Uh, now looking at AEW, they've, uh, they kind of rebounded. They had a, they had a super st- strong start to the year in January where they had, uh, they had several shows that did over 900,000 viewers. Um, it started off real strong. They got hit hard with the pandemic as far as their viewership went. They they hit a low in, in April. Uh, they averaged uh, 696,000 viewers that month with a 0.26 and 18 to 49, whereas that January, I believe they were at, let me look here, I think it was a, oh, 0.36. So, uh, but they, they, they've rebounded and um, kind of in that 750 to 850 range is where they're at, but not you know, again, we don't have last year, last October, it's hard to count that month because they had the two uh, inflated weeks. December, they were way down. There was also a week that they were off. Um, looking at AEW's numbers, it, it, it does seem kind of like they've um, they've grown from the summer, but they're back to where they were before or a little under, and they've kind of plateaued a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the interesting things that we saw over the year 2020, and I think really the story, the, the long and short summary of, um, of viewership in 2020 is how uh, pandemic hurt everybody. You know, mm-hmm. in April, May, maybe June, hurt everybody. Um, around that time, though, June, NXT and AEW started to bounce back, and Raw and SmackDown continued to sink until the Thunderdome came out and, until, and also Roman Reigns. Uh, returned around the same time um but yeah they've they've uh you know nxt and NAW bounced back and uh like dynamite is uh more decisively than ever beating nxt they had three episodes in december where they did over nine hundred thousand viewers and obviously that's that's winter is coming the mm-hmm. follow-up to it which was was their biggest viewership in over a year right and then then the Brody lee episode um I don't know. I, th- I think they're going to, in 2022, sort of, they'll probably do similar numbers to what they're doing. And I think the thing to watch is you know, what, what I would expect is that, you know, AEW and probably even, even NXT kind of just stay where they are. And I would expect Raw at least to continue to slowly decline. And uh, maybe SmackDown, maybe SmackDown, SmackDown seems to be doing all right right now. But, uh, you know, following WWE programming for the I don't know, my whole life is, has told me, or at least these last 20 years or so, has told me that it usually doesn't get better. It gets slightly worse. And uh, I would expect, you know, interest in, in Raw and SmackDown to, to decline a bit. Um, it, it's declining. Raw and SmackDown viewership are declining roughly at the rate of, of cable overall, except for ni- 2019 and 2020 for, in the case of Raw, where uh, Raw has started to fall harder than cable overall. SmackDown has done... Uh, a lot better because it's jumped around to better and better time slots and networks. But um, 
but no, I, I would expect in 2022 also for AEW, um, there will probably be another program for AEW. And I would guess that that would be, um, if you look at where, where they uh, were preempted to due to the NBA over the summer, um, I think the first place that they were preempted to was around six o'clock PM on a Saturday. And I know there were some other areas where they were moved right. to as well, but that would be my guess that, you know, the, whatever the one hour extra show is, will be uh, 6 PM Saturday, maybe TNT, maybe TBS, who knows, maybe even a uh, six Oh five. I don't know. Yeah. Well, historically when we've seen a, a company add a second show over time, we see it kind of dilutes the main show, you know? Um, and if you don't, then that second show kind of becomes just a B show and becomes nothing. Yeah. Um, do you think AEW is in danger of doing that by adding on a second show? Um, I would imagine it'll be kind of similar to, to those other patterns in history where the first couple of weeks will be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, um, the impression that I get, you know, we look at what, what AEW dark is, it has become, and it's no longer like this, this B show with a couple of matches on it. It's come from like 15 matches right. most weeks lately. Right. And I think, I think part of the, the usefulness of that is that they're, they're developing talent, right? They have a lot of talent and they have throughout the, they're not doing house shows. They're probably never going to do house shows. It's almost and, like they're uh, NXT in a weird way. Yeah. yeah I, I, th I think that's the structure that they're going to take with it is that this is our, our second rung brand. And this is where we kind of develop people. And, uh, you know, we want to do good ratings with it, but we don't, we're, we don't expect it to be like a second flagship or anything. And uh, maybe people work their way up from, from this show to, to be on the second show more regularly, which is kind of the way that dark works right now. And I don't think dark's going away either. I think dark will remain this YouTube show. Maybe once this show starts to exist, there's not 15 matches on it every week. Right. But I, but I, but I think Tony, Con I, I kind of got that impression from listening to the last Tony Khan conference call that he, he said something to the effect that he wants to have two, uh, developmental shows. Um, I guess that could mean uh, an AW Dark and uh, whatever the secondary one hour show is. And uh, and maybe there's kind of tears about like, you know, you, you put, you know, really important people on Dynamite and so on in the second one and the third one. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do think they really need to develop talent. And uh, this gives people match time. And uh, you know, they have a lot of wrestlers who have potential but need match time. And there's no, uh, again, they're never going to do house shows. And there's no indies right now for anybody to to get experience on either. Yeah. Um, all right. Final thing. Uh, when you're looking at really realistic wages, uh, realistic ways you could gauge uh, popularity and, and declines and and increases uh, for AEW, the other one would be pay-per-view buys. And we have seen, I mean, the pay-per-view buys that AEW was doing before they got on TV were, were amazing, like unlike anything we've seen for, for wrestling. Yeah. However, since they've added TV, their pay-per-view numbers have stayed uh, the same. And yeah. uh, I mean, they came off their hottest month this past month, this past January of their hottest TV ratings once things settled. And then that February pay-per-view, you didn't see that big increase despite the increase in viewership. Uh, why do you think that is? And what does, it, are we are we at a point right now where there's this bubble of wrestling fans that are just paying for everything and and we're not expanding beyond that? Or, or where are we at with that? I, th I think with AEW, the, the audience, who's the, the number of people who are aware of AEW and engaging with AEW are, so they had what, two pay-per-view, no, three pay-per-views, no. No, two, because I have the all out, the all in pay-per-view on, on here on this chart that I'm looking at as well. So they had two pay-per-views before they went to TV. Then they did one in November, just a month after being on TV. And it was, as you basically said, it was the same or even lower than mm -hmm. the two that they had done before. Um, but I think so with Jericho and Cody and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think pay-per-view is, is a hardcore product, right? You're, you're getting you're more ardent fans to buy it and uh you're getting it, it's 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 more valuable than running a, a single tv show still i think for them you know their their tv deal is worth like 44 million dollars a year and, and that's great but they make a little bit more when you when you run a pay-per-view and it sells 100,000 buys or 80,000 buys or wherever it might be um even with the split and everything um but i think th there's hardcore a harder core group of fans who were aware of AEW before it, it went on TNT. And I think compounded with that, you think about double or nothing, 
Double or Nothing did around 100,000 pay-per-view buys, I think. And there's sort of a, a discovery aspect, or there, I think there's a, a, a special kind of uh, excitement around their first show. I, I see this sort of manifest in when I look at Google web search. For example, when somebody debuts, there's this huge spike in their web searches, right? And it levels off after that. And I think there's something similar for AEW in that their introduction, there's this huge spike and it's sort of going to level off after that. And I, I guess you could also say that all these pay-per-views that they've done, if they were just an internet product somehow, they wouldn't, they're, those, these buys would be considerably lower. I think that's the case. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it speaks to as well how TV matters differently today. Like if, if this were maybe even just 10 years ago, you wouldn't expect a, a product that never had a weekly TV show to do 100,000 buys. Um, TNA in all of its years right. on TV, on Spike, never did 100,000 buys. I think they with did Hogan, at best. With Kurt Angle, with, yeah. Yeah, I think they did, did at best like 60,000 or something like that. I think Kurt and Samoa Joe did, a, a, it was one of their best. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was their best. But. One of the one of the cage matches, I think, is is right. among the highest, but you know something like forty percent lower than what AEW has done here. And I, but I, th I think it just speaks to the the momentum and the buzz and the, the excitement and credibility that AEW had coming out of the gate, and uh, the power of, of the internet, uh, you know, into the present. Um, but they you you could you could look at at these pay per view buys and say, well, they haven't gained any momentum here in terms of uh, adopting any new pay-per-view buyers. Um, but I think uh, when when wrestling, uh, when AEW gets more popular, or if it does, or when W gets more popular, if it does, is going to be because of um, new stars. And who's who's the new star for AEW or for WWE? You know, Drew McIntyre's there, and they AEW started out with a set of stars like Cody and Kenny Omega. But I think... Um, I think what often gains interest is is not just uh, a new star, but somebody who's becoming a, a new star for the, the first for the first time. Yeah, whether that was you know, think of examples in history, it'd be like Steve Austin in '98, and you know The Rock sort of parlayed that. And uh, I guess who would be another example? Goldberg, I think, yeah, is another. You could example. say Hogan in a sense, as he was established in yeah. wrestling circles, but to the mainstream, he kind of you know with he, he kind of became a star along with the I, I don't know i guess i know he had been around a long time but um and, and i can think of international examples like mystico in 2005 right. becoming a giant star and selling out uh, all these uh, attendances at arena mexico mm -hmm. and uh okada more recently in new japan in around 2012 or so so these, these people who sort of burst onto the scene and you know you have a, maybe a story arc and a coming of age story um so yeah, I, I think whoever, if we're going to, I don't know if we're going to get towards a boom era ever again, but if we're going to get towards a, a point where one of these brands really breaks out, it's going to be on the, uh, the wind of a new star who sort of comes of age and we have sort of a long journey with this star and they finally become somebody who's, who people really believe in and can really deliver, you know, uh, not just great matches, but stuff that people are really excited about and matches that people are really excited to see. And I think, so I guess my, my point is that I don't, I don't think whoever that person is, we don't, that person's not a main eventer right now. Right. It's, it may, may not be somebody who's even in either company right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> in almost 50 minutes, I, I really appreciate it. I'll, I always have a great time chatting with you. Yeah. Um, I, I, th thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Sure. Uh, I have a Patreon now, patreon.com slash WrestleNomics. And uh, if you support for $5 a month, I do some, some locked posts every now and then, but you will get the uh, 2020 year, full year in review uh, report as part of your monthly support. Um, I have, uh, if, you, if your Twitter account hasn't been suspended, I'm on Twitter at Brandon Thurston and WrestleNomics is on Twitter at, at WrestleNomics. And uh yeah. I have a podcast, WrestleNomics Radio, that comes out every weekend, which is in your podcast app. Busy man, but I, 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 lo I love your work. I love checking it out. And uh, thank you, as always, Brandon, for, for joining us. 
Yeah. And I might even, I've got a green screen somewhere here. I might even show up on Twitch. I have been experimenting. I might be like pointing instead of seeing all these random clothes behind me, I might ah. be point, pointing like a weatherman at charts soon. So hopefully. I'll... Oh, I thought you said you were going to start playing video games on Twitch, but no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know if Twitch is the, the, the best place for that, or maybe it'll end up on YouTube. We'll see. I'll have to negotiate with uh, Amazon and Google and see who wants me more. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks again. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us again. Anytime.